Hey everybody, Mr. MathBlog here. Uh, this uh, lesson is reasoning and proof. So our question here is how do we go about proving a statement? So we start off with what's called a conjecture. Conjecture is a statement that is believed to be true. For example, here's a conjecture. For the past five games, the coach recognizes that Tyler uh, throws a fastball for his first pitch. Therefore, the coach's conjecture is that Tyler will throw a fastball for his first pitch in the next game. Okay, does it mean he will throw the fastball? No, it doesn't, but that's his conjecture. So what he's doing is using inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that a rule or statement is true because specific cases before that are true. So the coach used inductive reasoning to make his conjecture that Tyler's going to throw that fastball. Deductive reasoning is the process that we use logic, and these are what we uh, draw proofs about is using deductive reasoning. So it draws a true statement right here. So it'll ask you, is it inductive or deductive? So inductive reasoning, it just makes conclusions from observing, looking at examples, guessing, to make predictions that are true most of the time, not all of the time. So here's some examples. Explain why uh, the given conclusions use inductive reasoning. So find the next term in the pattern, 4, 8, 12. So the next term is 16 because the previous terms are multiples of 4. So it's inductive reasoning because uh, the conclusion is based on observing three numbers before that. There isn't a real proof that it is going to be 16. Okay, how about 4 plus 7 equals 11, 8 plus 15 equals 24, therefore the sum of an even plus an odd is an odd number. Again, we're, uh, the conclusion is based on just uh, some previous examples or observing two things before that. How about uh, Jack's parents are both left-handed, therefore Jack's grandparents are left-handed. Again, uh, it's based on just some observations right here. Jessica's grades are better when it's cloudy outside. So, you know, it's just based on limited number of observations. There's no real proof of, you know, definitions, postulates, or theorems on that. So recall that a, a postulate is a statement that we accept to be true. It doesn't need a proof. So it's just something we're accepting to be true. Theorems, though, are statements uh, that, that uh, we can prove is true. And we prove it using uh, other definitions or postulates or other previously prov uh, proven theorems, etc. So um, uh, they would use deductive reasoning to prove theorems. So counterexamples is an example that shows a conjecture is false. So for example, a counterexample to the coach's inductive reasoning that Tyler's going to throw that fastball, that first pitch, would be that if he threw a curveball. That would be an example to show that his uh, conjecture was false. Okay? All right, so suppose we use deductive reasoning to show that an angle is not acute. Can we conclude that the angle is obtuse and explain? Well, if it's not acute, it could be a straight angle, it could be a right angle, or it could be an obtuse angle. So, so we can't make that conclusion. So if the angle is not acute, we can only conclude that it has to be a right obtuse or straight angle, not just an obtuse angle. Okay, so in uh, introducing proofs here. So, so we start uh, doing proofs, and you'll see this more as we get uh, later on into our textbook. A conditional statement is a statement that can be written in if-then form. If P happens, then Q happens. The P part is called the hypothesis. The Q part is called the conclusion. So, for example, in the conditional statement, if 3x minus 5 equals 18, then x equals 6, the hypothesis is the stuff right after the word if. So this hypothesis is uh, 3x minus 5 equals 18. The conclusion is the stuff right after the then word, so x equals 6 right there. Okay. So uh, here's some properties of equalities, okay, and we can write these in if-then form um, a lot of these right here. So I have a, a blank screen I can pull down. So the addition property just says if we add, if A equals B, then we can add the same number to both A and B and get the same thing. So if, we, if A equals B, then A plus C equals B plus C. We just added C to both sides. And the subtraction property works the same. If A equals B, then A a minus C equals B minus C. You've seen these before, you guys. Okay, so the multiplication property, again, if A equals B, then A times C equals B times C. Remember, whatever you do to one side of the equals, we do to the other side. And you see how these are written now in if-then form? Okay, the division property, again, if A equals B, 
okay? Uh, and you can't divide by zero, so the only stipulation here is uh, you can't divide by zero, so C can't be zero. Then A divided by C is equal to B divided by C right there. Okay, the reflexive property just says anything equals itself, so A equals A, you know, 7 equals 7, 5 equals 5. The symmetric property just says we flip things around the equal sign, so if A equals B, then just flip them around, B equals A. That's used a lot in proofs. We'll do a couple of algebra proofs. The transitive property says if A equals B, and this number right here picks up here, so if B equals a new number, then the first number equals the last number, then A equals C. That's called the transitive property. And then substitution property we use a lot. If A equals B, then B can be substituted in for A in any expression, so we use that a lot in proofs. We're just going to get started with some algebra proofs here. So use deductive reasoning and the pro uh, properties of equality to solve and justify each step. So we've done all this stuff before, but we probably haven't written why we did this. Okay, so if I said solve this equation, what would you do first? You would get rid of this minus 4, so you'd go plus 4, plus 4, and so we'd be calling that the addition property because we added 4 to both sides. Then I said take this blue guy and solve, and what would you do? 18 equals 3x. You'd divide by 3, divide by 3, so that is the division property. Okay, now to flip it around the equal sign, if I want x over here and 6 over here, do you remember what that's called? When it goes around the equal sign, it's called the symmetric property, so x equals 6. All right, let's try that again with this guy right here. What would we do first? We would subtract 17 from both sides, so subtraction property. There's other ways to solve this, you guys. This is probably the most common way right there. Whoops, that's not supposed to be an 8 right there, so excuse me while I fix this right here. So when we divide both sides by um, uh, uh, negative 4, now we're going to divide both sides by negative 4. Let's get rid of that little x again right there. All right, and then uh, so that's the division property, and then again we're going to use the symmetric property. So here we go. We're going to divide both sides or flip it around the equal sign, so we get uh, x equals two right there. All right, let me fix that right there. That's going to bug me. I send these to other teachers in my district, so I got to fix that up. All right, so here let's write these statements as a conditional statement. So let's change these to if this, then this happens. Okay, so all dogs have tails. All right, well if it's a dog, then it has a tail. Or if an animal is a dog, then it has a tail. Okay, now is that true? Yeah, maybe not. Uh, some dogs have cut tails, you know, so they're shorter tails, but they still have tails. Okay, you live in California if you live in Sacramento. Okay, the key pivot word is here's the if part. So here is if you live in Sacramento, then you live in California. So that's how that one would go. So watch out for where the word if is. So if you live in Sacramento, chances are you live in California. I don't know of any other Sacramento. So um, that's where I am, by the way. All right, so using postulates and segments and angles. So a linear pair is a pair of adjacent angles. Adjacent means um, they share a common side, you guys, whose non-common side are opposite rays. Opposite rays mean they make a straight line. So here's some adjacent angles, angle one and angle two. They share this side, and their non-common side makes a straight line. That's what opposite rays are. So this theorem says if two angles form a linear pair, then they are supplementary. Supplementary means that they add up to 180. So angle 1 plus angle 2 equals 180. That is if they're a linear pair. All right, we're going to use that here shortly. <clears throat> So use postulates or theorem to find the value of x in each, okay? So here we have a segment, and then we have s is in between. It doesn't mean it's in the middle. It just means it's in between r and t. Okay, so it tells us down here that rt is equal to 5x minus 12. Do you remember the segment addition postulate? Piece plus piece equals the whole piece? Well, that's what we're going to use, the segment addition postulate. RS plus ST equals the whole RT. So here we go. We just plug it in, combine like terms, and solve for X. And we get X equals 6 right there. Okay, nice and easy. All right, how about this? Here we're going to use the angle addition postulate. It says angle RST. Here's RST. So that's the whole angle. This whole angle is 15X minus 6. So this piece of the angle plus this other angle is going to equal the entire angle, 15x minus, uh, did I say 6, uh, minus 10. 
Okay, so we just plug it in, you guys. So ma the measure of angle RST, RST equals this angle plus this angle. So that's what this is right here. And we just plug in the X stuff and then combine like terms and then solve for X. Okay, nice and easy. All right, here's another one. Two angles, uh, LMN and NMP form a linear pair. All right, so we're going to draw a picture of a linear pair. Remember, a linear pair makes a straight line. It says the measure of angle LMN is twice the measure of angle NMP. Okay, so this is the bigger of the two. This one's the bigger one. So find the measure of angle LMN. Okay, so there's the picture. Now notice, notice um, uh, LMN is the bigger one. Here's LMN, and M had to be in the middle right there because it's the middle uh, letter in both of these. So it's the vertex for both angles right here. Okay, and here's angle NM. P, okay, so it kind of looks like this angle is twice this angle, or at least it's the bigger one right there. So if it's twice, let's use X's, you guys. X's are easy. Let this one be X, and this one's 2X, okay? And remember, linear pairs add up to 180. They're supplementary. So we just go X plus 2X equals 180. So 3x equals 180, or x equals 60. Now, now that's not the answer, because it says find the measure of angle LMN. Well, LMN is this 2x, so we're going to go ahead and say that's equal to the 2x, so it's 2 times 60, which is 120. Okay? All right, so, uh, so we're going to use postulates about lines and planes. Okay, so... Through any, these are just postulates, you guys. So through any two points, there is exactly one line. So here, these two points A and B make up the line line AB. Okay, any two points, there's one and only one line. You can say line BA also, but make sure you put a line symbol on top with arrows on both ends right there. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane that contains them. So as long as they're non-collinear, there's only one plane to, that can contain them. So here, point the three non-collinear points, A, B, and C, they make up plane A, B, C, or you can call it plane P, as long as it has a, a capital letter without a point next to it. A capital letter with a point means we're saying this is point A, this is point B, this is point C. So we can call this plane ABC or plane CBA or plane BAC or whatever, or plane P. Okay, so what they have to be non-collinear. If they're not uh, non-collinear points, say they're collinear points. There's more than one plane that goes through three collinear points. See these three collinear points? Here's plane Q and plane P. They both contain that um, those three collinear points. In fact, there's other ones here. You can think of like a, a paddle wheel, and this being the axle of a paddle wheel, and these are all the paddles. There's infinitely many paddles that go through a line. So they have to be non-collinear. If they're collinear, they can be more than one. Okay, if two points lie in a plane, say these two points A and B lie in plane P, then the line that contains those two points is also in that plane P. Okay, that's what that postulate says. If two lines intersect, they intersect in one point. So here we have lines L and line M. They intersect at point Y right there. Okay, if two planes intersect, their intersection is exactly one line. So here, the planes Q and P intersect in line AB or line BA. Okay, all right, so... Think of the corner of a wall, you guys. Think of one wall intersecting another wall, and that little corner would be this line AB right there, okay? Or the ceiling in a wall, that where the ceiling and the wall intersect is a line. All right, use the figure to name the results described. Okay, so we have this figure. It looks like we have plane F and plane N intersecting, and this line right here, and we got some other action going on. So what is the line of intersection of the two planes? Okay, that would be this line right here. So line BD or line uh, DB, however you want to say it. Just make sure you put a line sig uh, sig um, symbol on top with arrows. The point of intersection of two lines. Okay, so let's look at this line right here and this line right here. Where do they intersect? They intersect right there, and so that looks like point C right there, okay? All right, three coplanar points. So three coplanar points, say like uh, B... 
uh, say D and E. You can say C also, but include E so they're non uh, non collinear, you guys. So B, D, and E I chose, but you could have said E in there. They're coplanar also. There's a plane that contains those three collinear points. Okay, that's easy. Those three right there, B, D, and uh, B, C, and D right there. They're on that same line right there. Okay. All right. Now notice N is not a point and F is not a point. That is plane F and plane N. So that's point E because there's a point right next to it. Okay. All right. So draw a diagram of a plane with three collinear points and three points that are non-collinear. Okay. So we got to draw a plane. Here's three collinear points right here. And then here's three points that are non-collinear. And they're all in that plane right there. Okay. If you're in my class, I would probably assign you that homework right there. Take care, you guys.